Okay, so welcome to this next video in the playlist on signalling with Cyclic AMP. In this video, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, look at um, Ephrin A uh, signalling pathway and how this is used to dictate uh, the growth cone. The, well, it's used to do, uh, cause the retraction of growth cones of neurons and specifically it's used in um, the uh, growth cones of um, axons from retinal ganglion cells. So Ephrin A, um, axon growth cones and retinal ganglion cells is the topic for this video. Axon growth cones and um, retinal ganglion cells, which are usually abbreviated RGCs. Right, okay, so um, you might be wondering what this is doing in a playlist on signaling with cyclic AMP, but again, what, these, um, path what this pathway is going to make use of is oscillations in calcium, which then causes an oscillation in cyclic AMP. Okay, so firstly let me give you an introduction to um, these um, axons and what an axon growth cone is, etc. So, in development, when you are connecting up the eye, the retinal ganglion cells have to, uh, have to grow an axon, basically, and the axon has to end up in the right place. So, um, let's say this is, the, um, this is the retina here. Um, okay, so here's the optic nerve coming out. And basically, if this represents the retina of your eye, then the retinal ganglion cells are um, there somewhere like here. And basically, these retinal ganglion cells have to grow an axon that goes through the optic nerve and then is eventually going to end up right back in um, the um, back in the brain, basically. So. These are going to be retinal ganglion cells in our model. And basically what we're going to look at is, um, is um, how um, you control the movement, the growth of their axons. So these are retinal ganglion cells. Right, okay. So these retinal ganglion cells are going to give out this axon. So let's say this is the axon of the retinal ganglion cell, and it's coming, it's growing basically. And at the end of the um, at the end of this growing axon will be what's known as an axon growth cone. So at the end is an axon growth cone. Okay. So this is the axon growth cone, and uh, this is going to be the thing that grows and senses um, senses chemical messages and uh, decides on which route to go to. Axon growth cone. Okay, and basically one of these chemical messages that is going to tell the axon growth cone uh, get out of here, basically, retract, uh, is Ephrin A. So, uh, if you've got this axon growth cone growing into an area, and in this area there is a high concentration of Ephrin A, then Ephrin A is going to bind to the receptors on this axon growth cone, and the response of the axon growth cone to this is to instantly retract, basically. Okay, what we're going to look at in this video is why. What causes this axon growth cone to retract? We're going to look at at least how much of what it, we're going to look at what is known with regards to this. Okay, so basically these axons um, growth cones, whilst they are growing, they will also be undergoing neuronal activity. So continually, what is happening within this uh, axon is that it's firing. So the retinal ganglion cells, whilst they grow, they're not just completely silent as far as electrical activity is concerned. And far off from it, instead they are continually firing action potentials down here. Okay, so what you have continually happening in this growing retinal ganglion cell, if I draw it larger here, so here's the axon growing over here. Here's the nucleus of this retinal ganglion cell. And then right at the end, we've got this retinal, well, this um, axon growth cone over here. Okay, right. So continually what's happening is that you're getting action potentials being fired down uh, this growing axon of this uh, retinal ganglion cell, basically. So you're getting action potentials coming down here. Now, basically, what that means is that continually the, um, 
the membrane of this furthest portion, this axon growth cone, is undergoing uh, an action potential. So that means that what's happening is, um, okay, so let me go through the steps of an action potential. So uh, this portion of membrane here is going to be stimulated to undergo an action potential. And what's going to happen is that this neighboring portion of the membrane, that will be undergoing an action potential. And basically, some of the sodium that enters through this portion of the membrane when it undergoes an action potential will diffuse over to this portion. Okay? So, if we plot one of these graphs of voltage versus time, so this is voltage from the extracellular compartment to the intracellular compartment versus time, then initially the voltage is around negative 65 millivolts. Now, that means that the intracellular compartment's electrical potential is lower than the extracellular compartment's electrical potential by 65 millivolts. And basically, when the sodium comes in here, that's going to depolarize um, the membrane because it's going to raise the electrical potential inside, and that's going to cause uh, the difference between the extracellular electrical potential and the intracellular electrical potential to become less negative, i.e. more positive. So you get this initial depolarization. Now, if the depolarization of the electrical potential difference across this portion of the membrane is large enough, then it may well just depolarize it up to threshold potential. Uh, so uh, negative 40 millivolts is usually the threshold potential for voltage-gated sodium channels. So in this portion of the membrane here, there will be some voltage-gated sodium channels. So there is a voltage-gated sodium channel drawn there. Okay, uh, and let me just go over the structure of a voltage-gated sodium channel because it doesn't hurt to revise. So the structure of a voltage-gated sodium channel is that you have four domains, pretty much. So um, in the pore-forming unit of the voltage-gated sodium channel, it can be divided into four domains. Domain 1, which we'll call this domain here, this is domain 1. Domain 2, further back. Domain 3, over there. And domain 4, here. Right, so there are these four domains and basically um, this entire pore forming unit is a single polypeptide. Even though we divide it into these four domains, the actual whole thing is one polypeptide. Right? It's encoded by one gene. It's one continuous polypeptide. So the entire pore forming unit of the voltage gated sodium channel is a single, um, is a single um, polypeptide. Right, uh, so that's known as the alpha subunit of the voltage-gated uh, sodium channel, okay? Now you can also have an auxiliary subunit known as a beta subunit here. So this is the beta subunit, okay? And basically, uh, the beta subunit can modulate the function of the voltage-gated sodium channel. So, for instance, what threshold potential it opens at, um, maybe it's conductance, it can also alter inactivation properties, etc., things like that. Uh, so, um, overall, the alpha subunit forms a fully functional channel without the auxiliary subunits at all, but um, usually you will have auxiliary subunits. They also are involved in targeting the... Um, the um, voltage-gated sodium channel alpha subunit to the right place. Okay, so um, overall there are nine different genes coding for alpha subunits uh, labeled NAV, um, oh sorry, not like that, NAV uh, 1.1 through to 1.9 basically. Those are the uh, nine different genes coding for it. So you'll have a voltage-gated sodium channel in here, and when you get to threshold potential, what will happen is that this voltage-gated sodium channel will then open, and they'll then allow sodium to move through them, basically. So, um, sodium has a much higher concentration extracellularly than it does intracellularly. So, when you open this channel, sodium is going to move into the cell. Also, you have to consider the fact that the electrical potential difference across the membrane at this point is still around negative 40 millivolts. So, that means that the electrical potential intracellularly is lower than the electrical potential extracellularly, and since sodium has a positive charge, it wants to go where the electrical potential is lower, so that's the electrical gradient is also favouring the movement of sodium into the cell. So both of those things lead to sodium entering the cell, and when you move sodium into the cell, that brings positive charge into the cell, so that causes a rapid 
depolarization of the cell membrane, basically. And uh, that continues on until these voltage-gated sodium channels finally close. And they close on a time basis, so they close after a certain amount of time. Now, by the time they close, they have generally depolarized the membrane to about plus 40 millivolts. Okay, what then happens is that there are also, in this membrane, voltage-gated potassium channels. So I'll draw one of these for you. So voltage-gated potassium channels also have four different subunits. Uh, sorry, four. They're, they're split into four parts, the uh, pore-forming unit. But unlike voltage-gated sodium channels, where the distinction uh, was a little bit... Um, a little bit odd because of the fact that it was made up of a single polypeptide. In the case of voltage-gated potassium channels, all four of these um, different portions are, made, are different polypeptides. You, make, you put four polypeptides together to make uh, this voltage-gated potassium channel. Okay, now, these voltage-gated potassium channels are generally opened at the same uh, electrical potential as sodium channels, i.e. they'll be opened somewhere around here, basically. But, they're, well, they'll be activated to open at around there. The problem is that they take a much longer to open than the sodium channels. So, they only start opening in response to this depolarization at the time when the sodium channels have started to close. So the sodium channels close, and what happens is these start opening. Now, potassium is higher intracellularly than it is extracellularly. Also, look at the electrical potential difference across this membrane now. It's plus 40 millivolts, which means the intracellular compartment is at an electrical potential 40 millivolts higher than the extracellular compartment. So the electrical driving force is also to move the potassium out of the cell because it would prefer to be in the compartment with the lower electrical potential. So both the chemical uh, gradient and the electrical gradient are favoring the movement of potassium out of the cell. Okay, and I'm just going to uh, turn on some more light because it's gone awfully blue this